In 2013, um, a long time ago in the era of Facebook, 10 years ago, I happened upon a page that fascinated me and I've been following it ever since. And it's a page um, put up by a lady called Karina Waters. She's actually a lady from Perth who um, happened to have a daughter who was doing an exchange program in France and they came back to Perth and she was interested in possibly buying a little home where they could base themselves in France and then travel around Europe. That She really fell in love with France. She didn't really know the language. She was an accountant. Her husband was a doctor. And as because she'd been looking at real estate, um, one of the things that was interesting is these ads began to pop up um, regularly on the internet about places that she could buy. And there was this amazing building Um, and it's called the Chateau de Goudin. And she, it was for sale, and she thought, oh, I could buy a chateau. Well, she didn't realise that it was actually a possibility. And over the next three years of negotiating and researching and finding out what the possibilities were, she took a trip to France again with her husband, and she was only allowed, I really want to see these pictures. We're having problems, aren't we? I have 30 pictures to show you and not one of them is going to come up. Is that, is that what's going to happen? Because you really need to see it. It's like the best part of my whole sermon and you can't even see it. So you're going to imagine a chateau, but it's nothing like... I gave it to her. Why? Yeah, it's... Oh, Steve's got the USB. Ah, oh, we, can, we can't blame him because I did give it to them and they've obviously given it back so that we don't lose it. And meanwhile, I'm going to tell you, I want you to close your eyes and imagine a beautiful chateau. So after a lot of negotiating, and the reality is this lady only got to see four rooms of the 94 rooms this chateau is made up for because 90 of them had no ceilings or floors, Right? So you can imagine, okay, your imagination just shifted from beautiful chateau to run down, dilapidated, completely run down. And she was able to buy this chateau for half a million dollars, which is what our house in Strathfield say is probably worth now. But this was 10 years ago. She knew that it was going to take a lot. And in 2023, she's still working on it. But what's beautiful is she's made a lot of progress. So this is the chateau. Keep flicking through. Keep flicking through. (laughs) We're trying. Anyway, you can see there's a few rooms there, but there's 94, three three stories. And what I want to do is I want to take you through some of the pictures they took after they made it safe. So this is after they were able to put some structures in place to actually set it up so that, oh, we are going to get there, aren't we? I'm just going to keep moving because I really want to get to where God's taking me this morning. So in this house... Um, in these 94, she was able to, after, I think in her, the whole first year was about getting rid of some of the animals that had been living there, the debris from the animals that had been living there. There were trees that were actually growing inside this house. There was, she had to actually stabilise the house before she could actually do anything. And the history is that in the 1300s, it had originally been a fortress Um, especially for the religious wars. And then uh, some marquee came along and created a castle on top of it. And then in the 1700s, some aristocrat built this chateau. And then over time, the the, um, peasants from around them came and pillaged it and and kicked out the aristocrats and they took over it. And then it was taken over by some politician. When it was actually built in the 1700s, it was actually, the architect was one of the most famous architects in France. His name is Gabriel, if you into architecture. And so over the last 10 years, I've just followed their journey of doing all the work. And you are going to see some photos up here in Jesus' name. Not sure why it's not working. But anyway, so what I really felt as I've I've been following this, um, over the last couple of weeks, I was reminded 
of a verse that really spoke to me in my teenage years. When I was a teenager, I had some pretty amazing encounters with God, usually at a youth group or at a camp. So get your kids to youth group and camp. But it was actually in my bedroom doing my devotions and I'd been reading Luke chapter four, where Jesus had gone to the synagogue, his local synagogue, and they'd handed him the scroll of the day. And the scroll of the day was Isaiah 61. And he began to read this passage. And in that passage, I'm just gonna skip past all my beautiful photos you can't see. And I'm gonna read it to you. Hopefully you'll get to read it up on the screen one day or in your own Bibles one day. And it's, these are the words and I'm gonna read it from the original Isaiah scripture. And these are the words, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. And these are the words Jesus is reading, written several hundred years ago. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He sent me to tell you who mourn that the time of the Lord's favour has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. Oh, oh, okay. This, this is after they made it safe, seriously. That's looking up at the ceiling. This is one of the floors. This is when they started to put structural beams in place. This is when they started to tidy up one of the rooms. And they're getting to work and pulling in some tradies to help. This is one of the rooms, not quite finished, but you can actually stay there. You'll notice this is Karina herself um, restoring one of the walls under what was thick layers of paint. Um, it had been a boarding house in the early 1900s for some of the soldiers that were at war. And so they'd literally covered the whole place in lead paint in four layers thick. So she literally has had to scrape away the paint and discovered these amazing um, wallpapers and, and, and intricate details behind that paint. Keep going. This is one of the rooms you can stay in. You'll notice that the walls don't have wallpaper. This is the unfinished reason is because they can't afford the wallpaper because it's all hand painted. So if they were to pay for the wallpapers for these rooms, it would cost too much. So she's waiting. One of the things you can do with this chateau, that's one of the finished bathrooms. One of the things, just pause there. One of the things interesting with this chateau is what they've done over time is invited people to come and stay in one of their finished rooms in exchange for a trade. So if you're a tradie like a tiler or a painter or someone who can do construction work, you can go stay there for free food and board as long as you're willing to put your hand to it. Even now you can go and stay there and if you're willing to pick up a paintbrush or go and work in the gardens, you can do that for board. board. And eventually they wanna turn it into a hotel. Next one, this is the dining room. Obviously not quite finished, but they're using it. And this is just the outside looking through the gates. And if you just jump to the next screen, we'll sit there for a minute. So this scripture, I'll keep reading. We, in verse four we read, we will rebuild the ancient ruins, restore and repair cities destroyed long ago. We will revive them though they have been deserted for many generations. As you look at this scripture, if you wanna know what God's like, this is what God's like. In exchange for mourning, He brings comfort. In exchange for despair, festive praise. In exchange for ashes, He gives us beauty. This is your God. This is what the Spirit of God does when He comes. And when Jesus was in the synagogue, He sat down like a good rabbi would, and then He declares across this room, people, today, today, that prophecy is fulfilled. And He was actually declaring, this is known as a messianic promise. And He was declaring, I'm that Messiah who brings this from this day forth. This is not just a promise, this is your reality. And as I sat in my room as a 15 year old, I felt the presence of God. I was filled with the Spirit. And I felt like God give me this sense, this scripture wasn't just for Jesus, but it was for His people. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news. He sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He sent me. And I came this sense of how can I, who do I think I am that I'm like Jesus? And it was such a revelation of what the mandate on my life was, is that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I'm filled with the Spirit at this stage in my life. And in my 20s, this, this became my mandate and it's been my mandate ever since, week in, week out. 
But what I want to sit in is verse 4 today. Next slide. He goes from saying the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to shifting the pronouns to we. We will rebuild the ancient ruins, restore cities destroyed long ago. We will revive them, though they were deserted for many generations. And what I wanna do is remind you today of who you are and who we are. Anointed by the Spirit of God, we bring comfort, joy, praise in exchange for despair, discouragement and brokenness. That's the mandate on us as the church. And as I sit in this verse, and this is where I wanna sit, we are called builders, restorers and revivers. We are called to build, restore, revive in a world that's full of chaos where things are broken down and there is so much despair across the globe right now. We bring a different spirit. We're called a holy people, different. In every context of our life, we bring something different to what the world is saying. The world is bringing bad news, bad news, bad news. They use money, they pay money to bring you bad news, to stir up fear, despair and discouragement. We bring something different. We bring good news, we bring joy, we bring something different. So what I feel this morning is to remind you of your calling. In the industry that you work, you are called to be a builder. Right now, across every industry, things are becoming dismantled, chaotic, destroyed, broken down. It's like things are getting abandoned and left dilapidated. But I come with the Spirit of God, anointed with authority to bring the favour of God into any industry that I work. You're called to be a builder. What does that mean? In fact, if we can move to the next slide. If I'm called to rebuild, restore, revive, that means my identity, when the Spirit of God is in me and I've encountered the Messiah and we the church, our identity is as, next slide, master builders, master restorers and master paramedics. And I wanna unpack what that means because guaranteed there are people in this room that you cannot call me a master builder. Karina Waters, when she first bought that chateau, was an accountant. In fact, she says the only renovating she did was to try and paint her lounge room and she knocked over a can of paint and decided it wasn't for her. So when she started this process, she was anything but a master builder. But last year in Vogue magazine in Europe, she was noted as a master builder. She has a certificate from the government of France to recognise the work she's done to restore this historic building. That means that all she did from being just a, an average accountant to becoming a master builder is she built something. And she kept, and she kept going and she kept building and she kept building until she became a master at it. You know, if you, if you become a builder here in Australia, you don't start out as a master builder. You start out as an apprentice and you start out doing what you're told. How successful would a builder be if they didn't do what they were told as an apprentice? And I wonder if us as builders think we can tell the chief builder, the one who builds our lives, how to build. No, we submit ourselves to how the chief builder does and we keep building according to his instructions. The other thing that the build, a builder will do is they follow the blueprint of the architect. And one of the interesting things this Karina Waters has done is she's found the drawings from the original architecture in the 1700s and she wants to do everything she can to make it as authentic as possible to its original intent. So if my call is to be a master builder, I need to follow the blueprint of the master architect. And you know, there's some things about your marriage, there's plenty of blueprints out there. Which blueprint are you gonna follow? I have a blueprint, it's the Bible. It's the architect's drawings of what a marriage looks like. And I, it promises that if I, if I build my life according to the pattern, then I'll build with a solid foundation, solid walls, and it won't become some dilapidated weird thing. 
But when we choose to follow a pattern of our family, of our background, of our, our experience, of our broken relationships, of the despair around us, if we trust the blueprint of someone else whose life was destroyed and so they tell us what it looks like to have marriage. No, I build my life upon the pattern. And marriage, you, you approach your marriage with God, I wanna keep building, keep building, keep building. But so many of us get into a place where we're tearing things apart, pulling things down, undermining things. But God says, no, you have the spirit of builder. Do you know what makes an amazing master builder when it comes to marriage? Someone who's been married for a while and who keeps building and keeps building and keeps building. Then what about your workplace? I think in the education department, there is a blueprint God wants to give you a blueprint. He's the architect of what it is to gain knowledge and wisdom. And I promise you, when you follow the architect's instructions and you get close to the architect and you talk to the architect and get him to interpret what it is, God's gonna help you build something that it builds into kids' lives that will last legacy generations to come. You are a builder. You're a builder, but you're not just a builder. You're called a master builder. You wanna become a master builder. What about the industry that you work? You might be in the financial sector or you might be in social work. I don't know what it is. If you're just a stay-at-home mum, you're a builder. Take on the spirit of a builder who knows how to build according to a pattern, a biblical pattern, because the architect knows what he actually intended and the original intent. Can I flick to the next screen? Master builder. Uh, next one. Master restorer. A restorer is someone who takes something back to its original, but with great care and detail. A restorer is someone who takes something not revealed and reveals it and brings it to light. If your role is a restorer, maybe there's some things in your world right now that seem to be hidden, but God has mantled you with the Spirit of God where He's gonna reveal things that no one else can see because He's gifted you with this difference. You're called to restore. If, if I were to go to someone who's a master restorer, they know things I don't know. They're able to reveal things that I didn't even know were there. And so as a master restorer, there are gonna come people into your world who come seeking you because you're able to reveal something that no one else seems to know or no one else seems to reveal. Why? Because you have the Spirit of God on you. You're anointed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That makes a difference to who I am and how I approach this situation. A restorer is someone who's able to re-establish something back to its original state. I wonder right now when you look across the globe if the church needs to help re-establish things back to its original state. And there's always this idea that we need to be changing and transforming and new. But I'm wondering if we need to go back to some old things and restore things that were originally established but have become run down and dilapidated or someone's tried to reconstruct. I wonder if we become specialists at demolition instead of actually restoring. A restorer is able to repair and re preserve things. A restorer is a conservator. A restorer is one who's able to return something back to its original condition or as close to. A restorer is able to reclaim things that have been lost. You're called a master restorer. I wonder if today you could shift your mindset to I come to every situation to bring restoration. You know, God's purpose all through the Scripture is to bring restoration, restoration to relationships, restoration to Himself. But I become a conduit of that. I believe in this place, we don't just restore people, we're here to help restore society and culture and values and the fabric of society needs some restoration and some specialists in the restoration of the fabric of society. Church, that's our call. We're called holy for a reason, we're different. We bring something pretty unique. When there's ashes lying around, we bring something beautiful out of the ashes. You, a restorer takes something or a situation or a project that you're dealing with and your mindset is, I'm here to restore. I'm here to restore. I'm not here to demolish. I'm not here to undermine. I'm not here to tear down. I'm not here to deconstruct. I'm here to restore. I'm here to build. 
There are so many things in our society that are broken and ruins that need you in them. Some of you in situations, you're like, this place is dark and I don't wanna be here. I wanna be where the light is. And he says, I put you there to bring light to it. And maybe right now he's placed you right in the environment, the industry, the place that he's called you to bring restoration. So these are some of the things that the Bible says we are called to help bring restoration to. If the Bible promises he will restore joy. I bring joy. I don't bring grief because the Bible promised me he exchanged my grief for joy. So I bring joy, I bring restoration of strength, restoration of hope, restoration of honour, restoration of fortune, victory, faith, trust, relationships, restoration of sight. When someone can't see, I can help them see. When someone can't hear, I can hear for them. When Eli couldn't seem to hear what God was trying to say, he took a four-year-old and said, I'll speak through him. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Are you listening so that you can help restore hearing to a whole generation that is are, are full of noise? He's called us to restore courage, restore hearts, restore life, restore freedom, restore confidence. There are so many people struggling with confidence. I get to bring my confidence in God to you and add my confidence to your life and stir up confidence in you. Righteousness, integrity, restore the kingdom, restore your positions, restore again and again and again. He says He will restore again. So you might have already experienced restoration and that person might have experienced restoration 20 years ago, but they can experience restoration again because you bring restoration. He restores peace. He restores double portions. He will restore your portion. Everything that God's Word promises to restore to your life, you can bring to others' lives. The third thing, <coughs> Master Paramedic, the word is revive. And I chose paramedic because I like the word. It's something I'm not. I've been trained in CPR. I've never saved a life, never used it. Don't plan to put my mouth anywhere near anybody else's mouth for that purpose. But I can do CPR, I'm trained, but I'm certainly no master paramedic. We have Catherine Taylor here today. She's a paramedic on the way to becoming a master paramedic. What does a paramedic do? They're on the front lines, making sure people don't die and bringing things that look like they could die back to life or connecting them if they can't help in that situation, connecting them to a place where they will find life. The word is revive. And straight away, my head goes to revival. Root word, revive. But I'm a, a girl who grew up in Pentecostal weird churches all my life and the word revival makes me cringe. Why? Because we get this idea that revival is having four hour meetings every night of the week where the elitists stand on a stage and tell you that we're in revival and all those churches that aren't, that aren't doing what we do are not. That's not revival to me. Sure, revival can happen in those environments. Revival looks like this. Jairus, whose daughter is dead and people have come to mourn, comes running to the feet of Jesus because he can't do anything. He's a spiritual leader. He's a known person who people respect for his faith, but he can't fix it. So he runs to the feet of Jesus and says, Jesus, come to my house. My, wife, my daughter is dying. And what does Jesus say? Don't be afraid. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. He walks into the room and brings her back to life. That's revival. He revives her. He pushes out the ones who are the doubters who are causing a mourning. And he says, no, I wonder today if Jesus was looking for someone to pull into the room, would he pick you? Or would he move you out? Because you know what? He's looking for men and women who are willing to partner with him in revival, which is bring people back to life. And if your words are not breathing life, they're not aligning with your call to revive. I'm called to bring CPR, oxygen, breath. This word revive is actually the root word of resurrection. Jesus has already done the work of revival. 
I bring the resurrection power of Jesus into any environment. There are things that some of you are facing, you know what a revival is for me when you're in your workplace, is a project that seems dead or you feel stuck. As a revivalist, I bring it back to life. It is not dead, it's just sleeping. It needs the Spirit of God to hover over it. We look at it and go, oh, revival is all about healings and miracles. And yes, it is. Jesus bought revival. But so did John the Baptist when he went out to the wilderness a long way from a synagogue and began to speak repentance. And people were baptised and their lives were changed and he prepared the way for the Messiah who would bring the true baptism and true repentance. Revivalists for me, a revivalist is someone who's able to rekindle. When Paul says to Timothy, Stir up the gift, fan into flame. It's because his fire was beginning to die and become a little bit f- flat. And it's this word rekindle, revive. I come into environments and fan the flame and the passion for God. In my family, I'm a rekindler. I'm a fanner of fire. I'm a revivalist. I come into environments and my passion, my my love for Jesus, I'm the Paul to the Timothys to say, stir up your gifts when you're feeling like your spiritual life is flat. But hey, what are you doing about fanning someone else's flame? Why is it just for us, the pastors who stand on this pulpit or the leaders to do all the work of fanning? I can guarantee Timothy became a fanner of flames and a stirrer of kindling saying, hey, rekindle, rekindle, restore. If your passion is dying, this Scripture suggests that I've distanced myself from the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God and the anointing of God and the favour of God brings me into a position of revivalist. So simply go and spend some time with the Spirit of God. You don't need to be at an altar. Yes, that's amazing. And when there's a great atmosphere, it happens like that. There are revival meetings where you can have your fire stirred up. That's why I love places like summer camp and I love places where you can encounter God in that atmosphere. But you don't need to wait for some atmosphere. You are a master revivalist. You are a master revivalist. I wanna switch your mindset to say, they're the revivalists. I need to go to that meeting to say, I'm a revivalist. I'm a fan into flame person. I'm the person who can come alongside others and stir up their faith. I can go into my workplace and someone sees something about my life and I'm unapologetic about it because I'm a revivalist and I wanna stir something in their heart that ignites a flame in them that makes them curious about Jesus and the favour of God on me where I walk. I genuinely believe that we as Christians should be able to walk into any environment and the atmosphere shifts. There's favour there when I walk in there. I believe I should be able to walk into any room and things shift because I'm there and because you're connected to me. But the same is for you. You carry the Spirit of God. It means the favour of God is on your life. So therefore, you should be able to see a shift because you're there. When a project is stuck, Holy Spirit, I'm here and your Spirit is on this project, shift it. And if it's not shifting, show me why. Reveal, restore, help me see. Because I'm here, we shouldn't be stuck unless this project needs to be stuck. And if it's meant to be stuck, show me why. Because you're a revivalist. You bring life to projects. You bring life to people and teams. You bring joy and grace and mercy. You bring the Spirit of God to shift things from broken to being fixed. You in your workplace should rise to the top because the favour of God is on you. We are the church. He changes the mourning, the downtrodden, the nothingness to something significant. We bring the light. We br- I, I don't know how passionate you th- think I am. I'm passionate about you being the church, the master builders, the master restorers, the master revivalists. Next slide. I wonder if you've caught yourself or not caught yourself and you need to catch yourself being a professional demolition expert. Happy to tear everything apart with your words. Happy to tear everything apart with your thoughts. Looking at things from the bottom side up. Cup half empty. Yet this scripture tells me that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and He has anointed me. I have a responsibility to be a builder. 
a builder of family, a builder of marriage, a builder in my, as in my parenting. I will use my words to build, not tear down. I will use my words prophetically to strengthen, encourage, comfort. I bring the Spirit of God into every situation. I'm not here to criticise and undermine. And if I need to bring a different approach, it's because I'm a restorer. It's because I wanna see things go back to their original intent. I see things off kilter. I wanna approach it from the sense that the infrastructure and the integrity of what I am building is really important. I wanna speak to you about integrity for a minute. A builder has to care about integrity. What is integrity? the thing that keeps that thing straight and is able to carry weight. And if you don't care about integrity or you're off kilter or you're willing to actually sacrifice your character to fit in whatever, that whatever you're building will be off kilter and begin to become dilapidated. But God's called you to build things with integrity. And I wanna call out the unholiness of says that I have to take shortcuts, slick some paint on and do a quick fix when, with what I'm building. Nope. This lady's been building this building for 10 years, day in, day out, slowly, patiently, caring about integrity, caring about the integrity of the building, caring about the integrity of the detail because she cares that it will be authentic and that it's gonna last for generations to come. What's amazing is that the foundations of this building from the 13th century have never needed any work. And I just wanna finish with this scripture. Paul says this in Corinthians chapter three, there's this big argument going on in the community about who they follow. One follows Paul, one follows Apollos, etc. And Paul's like getting fed up with them. So he writes to them, he says, God has given me unique gifts as a skilled master builder who lays a good foundation. Afterwards, another craftsman comes and builds on it. So builders beware. Ooh, I'm speaking to you because I'm talking to the builders in the room. I'm speaking to the church. He's speaking to a church community. Builders, beware. Let every builder do his work carefully according to God's standards. What are God's standards? Holy, other, next level, perfect. For no one is empowered to lay an alternative foundation other than the good foundation that already exists, which is Jesus Christ. The quality of materials used by anyone building on this foundation will soon be made apparent. Whether it has been built with gold, silver and costly stones or wood, hay and straw, their work will soon become evident for the day will make it clear because it will be revealed by blazing fire. The fire will test and prove the workmanship of each builder. Is that not a heavy statement to take your building seriously? And if you neglect to take on the role as a, of a builder and as a master builder, you'll still be judged for how you built. You can neglect your buildings, you can neglect your marriage, you can neglect your relationships, you can neglect your team, you can neglect your workplace, you can ne neglect your kids, but you'll still be made accountable for how you built. And what's interesting is you've been offered so many different materials and you can choose what you build with. There are tools you can use. You can use costly materials or you can choose hay, wood, stubble. But when a fire comes, what do you hope you've built with? Something that's gonna last the test. And if it's wood, hay and stubble, it's gonna burn and disappear, have no substance. I love this idea of building and I, I wanna finish with this is Nehemiah. He's a cupbearer. He lives in a castle or a palace or a Middle Eastern something, serving a king, sipping wine and passing the wine glass to the king. Pretty cushy job. Then he hears about his city that is bro broken down and hasn't been rebuilt and he begins to weep because something grabs his heart. And so for a long time, he prays and seeks God about his city and he gets a plan and a strategy from God to go back to his city and rebuild the walls. And it literally takes him 52 days to build the walls. And Nehemiah goes from being a cupbearer to the king to be known as a builder of walls. But he spent more time praying about it than he did actually building. He spent double the time praying, asking God, how do I build it? 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 Show me what to do. 
He faced so much opposition when he got there, but it didn't stop him building. He came up against so many different things that were, were trying to sabotage the build. And I can promise you, church, you're gonna come up against everything that's gonna sabotage the work that you are trying to build. Everything, the enemy is gonna come with an onslaught of opposition against you building and building anything of substance. The temptation to give up and say it's too hard. Karina Water says every year she hits a point where she gets overwhelmed and wants to give up. It's too costly, it's too hard. Then she just digs in and goes, I'm here to build, I'm here to restore. And that spirit is the same spirit for us as a church. You will face opposition. There will be people who don't like what you're building or they have a different blueprint to you. But I can guarantee this, the spirit of the Lord is upon you because He has anointed you. You have a responsibility to build, but you do not do it alone. You have the Spirit of the Lord upon you. I wonder if I could have my band back. And we are gonna sing and we're gonna praise and we're gonna worship and I wanna open up the altar. If that's you with a desire, not just to be a builder, but to go back to the core, which is Spirit of God, anoint me. I need the favour of God on what I'm building. I need the favour of God on my family. I need the favour of God on me as a restorer. I need the favour of God. I don't want to approach anything in my workplace, in my industry, in my leadership, in my influence without knowing that I have the tangible Spirit of God empowering me to do what He's called me to do. And He has called us to be builders, to be restorers, to be revivers. I wonder if you need a shift in your mind. I'm so aware in this place that maybe you've been building your own life according to a different pattern. Maybe you're the one who's broken down and dilapidated. Maybe your faith is the one that needs restored. Maybe your fortunes need restored. You know, the vision of our church is restore, raise up, release. Restoration is a gift to you first. And the master restorer is here to bring restoration in a moment of, the t of contact with the Spirit of God. Maybe you've allowed the fire in your own heart to diminish. It feels like someone's throwing some water on the coals of your heart. It could be an experience that's left you disillusioned and in despair. But the promise is for you. I wanna read that Scripture as we come this morning. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives be released and prisoners be freed. Maybe you're the brokenhearted this morning. Maybe your heart's been shattered. Or maybe you're grieving. He sent me to tell you who mourn that the time of the Lord's favour has come. There's a shift that's about to come for you who are grieving with loss. To all who mourn, He will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. We will rebuild the ancient ruins, restore and repair cities destroyed. We will revive them. Church, why don't you stand with me? I don't know where you're at in your walk with Jesus, but He's the master restorer. And as he sat down in that synagogue and declared this, this today is your reality. That no longer do you have to sit in mourning and despair, but you can sit with joy in your heart, overflowing with the Spirit of God and bring that to every environment that you come. I come into whatever place I work, whatever place I engage, whatever team I'm working as the builder, not the destroyer, as the restorer, as the revivalist, the one who brings and carries the anointing of the Spirit of God. Surely church, you're hungry for what God has on offer for you when you step out of these walls and step into your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Some of you are in need of miracles. The Spirit of God is here to bring a shift in how you look. And what you thought would be a quick fix is gonna be a building project. What you thought would be an instant miracle is gonna be a process that takes time because God is rebuilding from the core, rebuilding some stability in the core of your spirit. And I want you, if that's you, to come and experience, I'm not, I haven't got anything special, but I believe that God wants to alter some things here right at the altar and begin a process of rebuilding your life, but also shift your mindset into how you're, you're approaching. We, the church, are the builders. We, the church, are the restorers. We, the church, are the revivalists.
We're the revivalists. We're the revivalists. We're not waiting for some weird thing to happen. We just want to be full of the Spirit of God. We're going to sing this song again. Come, live in me and take I want all my life to be taken over, not just my Sundays, but my Mondays and my Tuesdays and my Wednesdays. This mandate on us as a church to restore, to build. I'm a builder. I'm a builder. I'm a builder. Give me the bricks. God, show me the bricks to build with. Show me the tools, the resources. He has all that you need and has equipped you to do the work. 